So let's get to talking about Latino Vote. Um, I want to start out um, by sharing just a little bit about what the project is, uh, the organization that it's housed within, and why this should be a key issue, not only for Latinos, but for all Idahoans. And I hope that when you leave here, uh, you will agree with me as to why it's such a critical issue, not only for Latinos, but for us all in Idaho. The Idaho Hispanic Caucus, uh, Institute for Research and Education, is the organization that is a, it's a small nonprofit and has a small budget. We run the organization through a lot of volunteers. Uh, the organization um, was a spin-off as a C3 in um, the year 2000 after the Idaho Hispanic Caucus, which is a C4 organization, was created right after redistricting of um, 1990. All of you are familiar, right, with what redistricting is. Um, I know that as I talk with youth, in junior high, high school, and especially Latino youth, sometimes we're not as familiar within our community. We know what census 1990, 2000, 2010 are, but how does that, um, what is the relationship between census that happens every 10 years and then redistricting? And I think in Idaho, uh, two things happened this year uh, with the GOP last year closing uh, their primary. Uh, there was confusion in the May elections. And the other thing that added to some people being confused was um, the redistricting. And that those of us that were in one district at one point might not be in that district. And so some of those things create a barrier um, for voters who are not as informed, who are not as active, um, and who do not have access to some of the information that some of us enjoy. So the caucus was created in 1990, 1993, um, after the 1990s um, redistricting. And part of that, well, I won't say part of it, but all of it was motivated by the fact of how the lines were drawn after the 1990 uh, census and the redistricting shortly after that. And we as, La as Latinos in Idaho did not feel we got what we deserved and what we needed. I know Arnold posed the question to ask you, how many Latinos are there in Idaho, right? Some of you may know. Uh, some of you may be here to find that out. There, according to Census 2010, and that number has changed clearly because we're almost at the end of 2012, um, 177,000 of those who were counted. Back in 90, 1990, there was an undercount, a huge undercount, um, close to 20,000 undercount for Latinos. So of course, when it comes to redistricting, right, there's gonna be an impact if our community has not been accurately counted. We got better in 2000, we got even better in 2010. So according to, 20, to 2010 census, there's approximately 177,000 Latinos in the state of Idaho. And the makeup percentage-wise of Latinos in Idaho is 11.2%. .2%. We are the largest ethnic minority group in the state of Idaho. And back to the creation of the, of the caucus. Uh, the mission of the caucus is the social, economic, and political empowerment of Latinos in Idaho. And for some, that sounds a bit too radical. But the reality is, if we are the largest ethnic minority group in the state of Idaho, if we are contributing economically and otherwise in order for Idaho to thrive, does it not make sense that we too have 
the real and the true representation that our community deserves? And of course, I believe that the answer to that is absolutely, we should. And that it's not just up to us as Latinos to make that come about. The hope of our community, I always think, are young people, young people like you, uh, young people and especially educated young people tend to be more open-minded. Um, I often use the word progressive, but that's not a really popular term, not in Idaho, definitely not in Canyon County. Um, but to be able to think outside the box in how we can make, make things better. So Latinos do make up 11.2% of Idaho's population. So, I know that most of you know the answer to this question. How many Latinos uh, serve in the Idaho State Legislature right now? Does anybody have the answer to that question? How many Latinos uh, serve in the Idaho State Legislature right now? Yes, one? Okay. Um, Right now, we have two individuals who identify as Latinos. Uh, a good friend of Alex's and mine, Cherie Buckner Webb, the first African American woman elected to Idaho's legislature two years ago and is running for the state senate this year, uh, always keeps it real. I love Cherie for that reason. She says, You know, Maria, I know they identify as Latinos, but let's be honest here. They are biracial. They, at least, you know, the one representative, and of course I've never heard them, so I don't know, right, whether this is a fact or not. This is the conversation that Representative uh, Bugner Webb and I had at the state capitol last year. Um, they do not speak Spanish, right? The one represented representative has acknowledged that they do not speak Spanish. So they do identify as Latinos. Would they be able to converse, to ask those who are limited English speaking or monolingual Spanish speaking, what do you care about? What are the issues for you as an individual, for you as within your family, within your community, right? So we do have two individuals that identify as Latinos, according to representative. Uh, Buckner Webb, they are biracial. And how many of you know how many Latinos uh, have served in the Idaho State Legislature in the history of Idaho? Does anyone know the answer to that question? Um, some people would say if we count the two current ones and those that have come before, then that number, um, some would say the number is five, some would say the number is six. And again, it goes with this definition of Latino, right? Um, two individuals, three individuals that have served, um, Jesse Verain, who considers himself the first Latino elected to the state legislature. Uh, after him, um, Elmer Martinez, who is from Pocatello and is running for county commissioner, and then our current congressman, uh, Raul Labrador, who also served in the, um, in the legislature here for the state of Idaho. And before Jesse, um, my understanding is that there was a Basque gentleman, but considered himself Latino, that served. So again, depending how we define Latino, five, uh, perhaps six. My contention is um, that we should have at least 11 uh, Latinos, Latinas, and not just somebody who is Latino surnamed or uh, has a Latino name, but that really knows our community, that knows the issues of our community, and that will advocate and represent our community. So I share that because when the caucus was created, and when we talk about social, economic, political power, um, we must be at the table. We must be part of the dialogue, the discussion. We must be the decision makers, the policy makers, the lawmakers. 
um, for purposes of education, for purposes of employment, healthcare, immigration, whatever the issue may be that is critical to our community. So that's a little bit about the caucus. Uh, Idaho Latino Vote is a nonpartisan uh, effort. The C3, the Institute for Research and Education, is C3 under IRS um, definition. The C4 is the one that usually that arm of the caucus uh, has surveyed, has endorsed candidates. And again, it is not one party or the other, but it is candidates who will represent Latinos and Latin Latino issues um, at the various levels of government. So with Latino Vote, um, it's been around um, since the mid-90s in a more focused way uh, since December of 1999. At the time that we started, there were less than 10,000 registered Latino voters in the state of Idaho. Most of those were here in Canyon County. Um, by the end of 2010, that number was uh, 25,430. So it had more than doubled. And that number looks really good until we look at how many Latinos in Idaho are eligible to be registered to vote. And uh, thanks to Alex, and because we do watch um, Pew Hispanic Center for their updates uh, about these numbers, and thanks to Alex to stay on top of that, uh, the numbers were released just recently. Um, and the number, um, according to Pew Hispanic Center, of eligible Latino voters in the state of Idaho is 69,000. So when we look at, at the end of the 2010 general election cycle, where we were so proud at one level that we had 25,430 Latinos registered to vote, um, we're not even halfway there. And there are challenges. And I hope again that as um, I finish the presentation tonight, that you will um, consider participating as part of the Hispanic Caucus or in the minimum as part of Idaho Latino Vote um, in the state. So 69,000, 25,430. I am happy to report though that during this cycle, there was Latino Vote, the Hispanic Caucus, Community Council of Idaho, and ICANN, those three organizations. Uh, two of the organizations are service providers. Um, Latino Vote, the caucus, is focusing on advocacy, organizing, electoral organizing, and working on issues. So the goal that we had between those three organizations of Latino voters to register during the cycle was 2,500. I am happy to report that we exceeded that goal, but one of the things as a reporter was here from Los Angeles this summer, she um, was very nice and very blunt, and I appreciated that very much because she said, you know, Maria, the 2,500 is a great goal, but she said, Given the gap, at that time, we knew that there were approximately 60,000 eligible Latino voters in the state of Idaho. But when you look at the gap of, you know, let's say under 30,000 and the 60,000 that are eligible, there is a huge gap. And of course, we know that. We know that. But again, uh, as a small organization, relying on lots of volunteers, not only in Canyon County, uh, but in Bingham County, in Minicaja, uh, in Twin Falls, in Jerome, the various counties uh, throughout the state, it's what we'll be able to do depending the people that are involved that are willing to help with this work. And I will share that registering voters is easy. That is so easy to do. It really is. It takes less than three minutes to fill out the voter registration card. That action is the easy action, but yet there's work to do. 
in that area. I will share, um, because these are the significant, um, with redistricting of um, 2010, um, the significant, quote unquote, Latino legislative districts. How many of you are from Idaho, with a show of hands? Because I know College of Idaho has uh, students from out of state too. Pretty much a majority. So those of you that raised your hand, how many legislative districts do we have in the state of Idaho? Anyone? Just a guess, because this is the way we learn, right? We may not know, but we guess, and then we get the answer, and we'll remember. How many legislative districts in the state of Idaho? Let me make it easier. How many legislative districts in Canyon County? Anyone? Especially those from Idaho? In Canyon County or in the state? Canyon County, we have four full legislative districts and part of another one, right? In, and I brought sample ballots in the back, those big yellow uh, poster-like papers are sample ballots. And you'll be able to see the part of the district that we have in Canyon County is nine, and the full legislative districts that we have are 10, 11, 12, and 13. If you live in Caldwell, you are more than likely to be in Legislative District 10. I live within city limits of Nampa. I'm in 12. But um, 11 and 13, you know, surround some of those cities, right? If you're in Middleton, you're in Legislative District 11. And so in the state of Idaho, we have 35 legislative districts. And therefore, because each legislative district has one state senator and two House of Representatives, we uh, have a legislature with 105 lawmakers, okay? So, and that's the number that I definitely, as a Latina and as a Chicana activist, want to see influence this decade, uh, where we will see more Latinas, Latinos, at that state capitol. Um, so, Latino Vote focuses District 10 uh, here in Canyon County, Caldwell, um, because the Latino population is significant in Caldwell. Um, District 12, where I reside in Nampa, and again, because Latino, um, the, the makeup of the city of Nampa, uh, 24 point, you know, we round it up to 25%. So one quarter of people that live in Nampa Idaho's second largest city is Latino. Caldwell's percentage is higher than that. Do you remember, Alex? I think it's more like 32, 34. It's higher than the 24 point whatever, rounded up to 25. So basically 10, 12, and then District 27, which is Kaja and Minidoka counties. Uh, Burley Rupert are the um, county seats. And those were my old stomping grounds before I moved to the Treasure Valley. Uh, my family settled out of the migrant farm worker stream in Hayburn. A lot of people like, I've never heard of that little town. It's just this little dot, kind of like a notice Parma, those kind of little dots. Um, and then District 31, Bingham County, Aberdeen, and Blackfoot. So um, that's where Latino Vote focuses um, the majority of its effort but not to say two things that are really important, and I always share this with people. One, just because it's Latino Vote Project does not mean we only register Latinos. That is our priority, right? But when we're doing tabling, when we're covering events, if somebody who's non-Latino wants to be registered, we don't turn them away. Um, we register them especially if they're a young person, 18 to 24, or a woman, because those two groups do not participate electorally at the level that they could should in the state of Idaho either. Um, the other group that Idaho Latino Vote is probably the only project that actively has been doing this um, since the mid-90s is registering former felons, because there is this myth in the state of Idaho that once you've committed a felony in the state of Idaho, you are forever barred from participating. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not true. In some states, that is true, but in Idaho, that is not true. 
if somebody has committed a felony but has finished probation parole, they can register to vote again. And there's not enough that's done to outreach and to get that message out. And so many former felons think that they can't participate, but that is not true. So again, if you're non-Latino and want to be registered, Latino Vote helps you. Um, even though we focus in these specific legislative districts, doesn't mean we don't do work outside of these legislative districts. We do work throughout um, the state of Idaho. Uh, anywhere where there are numbers of Latinos, uh, we are there to do that work. So I said that registering work, uh, registering potential voters, that is the easy part of the work that we do. Um, I will talk for the next, because I've got about four minutes left. I understand that some of you have to leave. And if you leave, I want to be sure, and you take a sheet if you're interested, because this, this, the second part or third part of my presentation is around the critical issue of mobilization of Latino voters and participation in Idaho's electoral process. So we still have work to do, clearly, if we have less than 30,000 and the universe, the pool is 69,000. There is work to be done. The performance um, is what is extremely low. And that is what the caucus, Latino Vote, and other partners will continue to focus our efforts on, is because it doesn't do us any good to register 5,000 new Latino voters in an election cycle like this cycle when we don't mobilize all of those new voters. Um, sad that Canyon County, um, when we look at presidential election like this year, um, Canyon County does not even rank um, in the top 10 of performance. Um, sad but true. When um, we have statewide and local elections, like in 2014, uh, Canyon County does rank number six in performance. But when you hear the number uh, of percentage of voters in those elections, uh, you will understand why I believe that this is critical work in the state of Idaho. Um, the top performers in a presidential election year are Washington County, Twin Falls County, and Blaine County. Those are the top performing uh, Latino counties uh, with 82%. That 82% is not as high as non-Latino participation, which is why it is important that it not only be Latinos that, is, that are doing this work, but that it be non-Latinos that are also engaged in helping Latino voters get out to vote. Um, in a statewide, as was 2010, and when we have um, the elections in 2014, um, Washington County is at the top again, but at that time with 51%, not 82%. What the caucus and Latino Vote have been doing is to move these percentages to be the same as during the presidential election year, uh, including city elections, which will be coming up next year and including school board elections that happen every May of every year. And so we don't look at a lot of folks and a lot of Latinos uh, get sort of um, programmed that elections happen one every four years, but elections happen every year. There's different types of elections and that's one of the pieces that we do a lot of education about is to get us out of that mindset that we only vote once every four years for youth, for women, for Latinos, and for other disadvantaged um, groups. So what Latino Vote, uh, when we first started, the performance of Latinos in Idaho was 19%. 
So to move to 40 or to 80%, we have made a difference, but we need to do more. We still need to do more. Um, and I hope that some of you uh, will be interested enough uh, to engage in helping to do that work on the ground. I'm not talking about 20 hours a week, you know, or even 20 hours a month, but two hours a week in, in helping do some of this work. Um, so the other thing that Pew shared and that is often a barrier, um, how many of you know uh, what the Latino dropout rate, um, that's what dominant society calls it, dropout, we say it's push out. Do any of you know how many Latino youth in the state of Idaho do not graduate high school? Anybody? Because that's something that Pew um, also shared. And, and I am asking that to um, talk about one of the barriers that we have around civic engagement. 30% um, of Latinos in Idaho do not graduate high school. It's a 30% dropout rate in comparison to 10% of non-Latinos. So when is it if we are not getting it at home? I was really blessed. I grew up in South Texas. My dad uh, was born in Texas, and my dad has always, I, I can, he's 80 years old, he lives here in Caldwell. I do not believe my dad has ever missed an election. And one of the things that I share, because the Voting Rights Act is relatively new, it's not that old, but pre-Voting Rights um, Act, uh, communities of color uh, had to pay a poll tax in order to participate in the electoral process. And there was a deadline by when you had to pay that. And I always remember my dad, right, sort of pinching his pennies because we were poor and being sure that he was gonna have enough to pay for the poll tax. And he still has the receipts and some of that is gonna go in my book when I write that book. But I grew up with a dad that was very active and talked openly to the kids about voting and that that was the way our voice would be heard and that it was critical to vote in every single election. Uh, but not every individual grows up with that kind of setting or that kind of example. So usually, uh, as we go through school, when we first learn, right, about some of these issues, the process, et cetera, senior year American government. That's where we get exposed. Um, so if 30% of our youth are not making it to their senior year in high school, then they don't have that opportunity. So that is one of the barriers. And we know that children can be um, that gateway uh, to the parents often. And so um, we really focus 18 to 24 year olds for them to be registered, for them to know, for them to participate, and also engage their families. Because there is a lot of power uh, with you as youth. And you, I always say, are our present and are our future. Um, and, and that's why I hope that you will um, become involved. So I think my time has run out because I know that um, we wanted to have time for some questions and answers. And one of the, one of the characteristics uh, that I want you to keep in mind, I know I've used the term Latino, uh, and the name of the project is Idaho Latino Vote, but the name of the organization is Idaho Hispanic Caucus. And I have labeled, because that is how I ident identify, is a Chicana activist. So I've thrown at three terms, right, um, all in one presentation. Um, and sometimes people like, okay, so what is it? Is it Latino? You know, because that's usually how it's pronounced, you know, by dominant society, Latino, you know, Latino, or is it Hispanic, or what? But one of the, one of the characteristics and one of the important things from Pew, and I do hope that you will go and look at um, Latinos in the 2012 election, 
under Pew Hispanic Center, you can um, find it online, that an important uh, characteristic of Latinos in Idaho is that eight out of 10 uh, are Mexican descent. Um, that we're pretty unique in Idaho because we don't have the level of diversity that like a Florida, a California, a New Mexico, a Colorado, um, over in New York, New Jersey, we don't have that level of diversity. Most of our folks are Mexican descent. Um, and if you look at um, Erasmo Gamboa's uh, book, if you haven't read that, but, uh, Hispanics in the Pacific Northwest, you can learn of the history of Idaho and treatment uh, of Mexicans especially, um, and how that oppression and how um, the ill treat treatment of Mexicans in this state uh, has gone on for a long, long time. And so some of the things that are happening uh, that people are talking about and have made the news in even what the GOP in Idaho did uh, with closing the primary, um, it, it's things that don't help increase voter participation. They are actions to suppress the vote and, and, and you really have to pay attention to that. When I talk about former felons and how there is no, there is no concerted, there is no organization other than what Latino Vote does and some of its partners um, to be doing outreach um, to certain groups of people. And, and we really need to look at some of those policies um, to create policies that increase participation, not policies that suppress. Uh, because our voter turnout, I've talked about Latino vote, but if you look at primary turnout, uh, it is so low. If you look at city of Nampa, because uh, I've been doing the number crunching for many years, I mean, it is really tragic at one level. That 16% or 20% or 23% of registered voters decide who governs. Um, but that when we don't get out and participate, we really are deciding too indirectly to maintain the status quo in Idaho uh, when we don't participate, whether as a female, uh, because women don't do as well in, in participation, either whether as youth, 18 to 24, um, whether as Latinos, uh, that we in fact are voting by not voting uh, to keep the same people in instead of uh, electing new folks and potentially better folks uh, to govern our cities, our counties, and our great state of Idaho. So thank you so much. I'll open it up for questions if that's what you'd like, um, Megan. I do want to take, yes, this young woman right here. Oh, uh, you mentioned that there are 177,000 Latinos in Idaho, and only 69,000 are eligible. Are eligible to vote. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the rest? Well, we know, right, the four criteria to be eligible to vote, right? Uh, the four criteria, U.S. citizen, not every Latino in the state of Idaho is a U.S. citizen. We know that a certain percentage, right, are lawful permanent residents. If there's something you can take away today, um, and especially in the discussion of immigration, there are people that are here without documents, right? Please do not call them illegals. They are undocumented individuals. Some of them are in process to become legalized, and then there's a huge difference between becoming a lawful permanent residence or e resident or even a temporary, in some cases, uh, legal resident to being a US citizen, 
right? They're different. And a lot of people like, oh, well, how come they're not becoming U.S. citizens? You can't go from having no status and make a quantum leap. That's not how this great country, right, the system works. So U.S. citizens, some of them are not U.S. citizens yet, but they will be. And then the second criteria is to be 18 years old. Uh, if there is someone, two things that I wanted to share with all of you, because there's still time. Uh, if somebody's going to be 18, they're 17 right now, and they will be 18 by November 6th, they can register and vote in this election. Um, and um, a little bit of history about um, this whole, you know, are we progressive as a state uh, in voter um, participation and opening the doors and making it as easy as possible for people to participate. Uh, in 1994, when Motor Voter came to be, Idaho opted out of Motor Voter. What Motor Voter would have done, uh, that when we uh, went to um, apply for a driver's license in Idaho and we met the four criteria to be a voter, we would be automatically registered to vote. We would not have to do anything. We would be automatically. But Idaho opted out of that. Um, I have my opinions and theories as to why they did that. In order to be able to opt out of it, they had to agree to be a same-day election day state. So that's why up until election day, we can still register and vote if you miss the early registration cutoff on Friday, October 12th. So the second criteria is um, your age. You gotta be 18 in order to participate. The third criteria is you've got to live in the county uh, where you are residing on election day for at least 30 days before election day, right? So if somebody moved here yesterday, uh, they're not eligible to vote, definitely not in Canyon County. And then the fourth one, is that you do not have any legal disqualifications. And the translation to that, and it's right in the voter registration form, because that language did not used to be there. It was the ACLU, the Human Rights Commission of Idaho, and Idaho Latino Vote Hispanic Caucus that got the Secretary of State to make that change. And that was after the fiasco in Florida and after HAVA, or HAVA, the Help um, America Vote Act after the 2000 election fiasco. Um, so basically the voter registration form reads that if you've committed a felony but you've completed your sentence and you're not on probation and parole anymore, uh, you can vote. So that's the fourth criteria. If, if you are a former felon and you are on probation parole, you can't uh, register to vote. But those are the four criteria. So not everybody meets those four criteria. The other important fact from Census 2010 is that the average age of Latinos in Idaho used to be 32. We're a relatively young community. The age went down to 25. The average age of Latinos in Idaho is 25. But again, um, the 18 to 24, Pew Hispanic Center includes it 18 to 29, but we know that that young age group tends to not participate, right? They're busier doing other more important things uh, for teenagers and young adults than to participate electorally. So I hope that that answers um, your question. Anybody else? Yes. Right, um, 
part of it, um, and it's really interesting, one of the things that changed in 1995, especially for Mexican descent Latinos, um, and sort of that barrier to becoming a US citizen, right, was people still wanting to maintain their Mexican citizenship and feeling or believing, which was true at the time, right, that you would give that up and become a US citizen. In 1995, when the then president came from Mexico to DC and saw the state of affairs, especially of Mexicans in this country, uh, Mexico now, after that, after 1995, recognizes dual citizenship. The US does not, but Mexico does. So somebody uh, from Mexico can still become a US citizen and not lose their Mexican citizenship. Um, and, and if they wish, they can go back and vote, but I believe they have to do it in person to go back, but I'm not 100% sure to participate in the Mexican elections. So at some levels, um, yes, it does appear that we're passive, but it has to do more. And Dr. Juan Andrade from USHLI, um, the US Leadership Institute in Chicago and Washington DC was just in Boise a couple of weeks ago. It's that we have to give, uh, for, Latino, for Latino voters, there has to be a reason. There has to be a great reason for them to engage and engage significantly. Uh, I believe part of the problem is that we haven't yet run a significant number of Latinos all at one time. I believe that uh, folks do get more excited and believe in the process more when they see some of our own running for office. And not just um, you know, Latino in name, but Latino in philosophy and belief in action and everything. So that, I, Dr. Andrade hit really hard on that. We need to be running more Latinos for elected office. And that's another piece, like I said uh, earlier, that it isn't. I, I firmly believe that that's not just our sole responsibility. I think the Latino community, we've done our work, we continue to do our work, but we need um, mainstream Idahoans and citizens to also engage in that. Um, I often frame it in terms of, isn't it tragic? that we are not up in arms, quote unquote, as radical and liberal as that sounds, whether as a Latino community, uh, that we have you know, um, two individuals who are biracial and identify as Latinos, but that we don't have individuals that look like some of us in this room. Uh, from a Latina and a Chicana activist perspective, and part of the reason that I have run in the past and that I will run again in the future, but that I help other women, other Latinas that are interested in running, um, because it's really tragic um, that no one really is looking I mean, that, at that as a problem. That uh, women, we are the largest minority, right? Uh, even though that's the way around policy were perceived. You look at the attack on women by the state legislature this last session and nationwide. And some of the things you know, that have been said by candidates just recently during the summer. So the attack on women and that we're not up in arms about that. Uh, from a Latina perspective, the fact that we have never elected a Latina to Idaho State Legislature, I think that there's something really, really, really wrong with that. Um, and that we need to be doing more. I know Irma Morin, the Director of Community Council of Idaho, came back from Utah really excited. I look at Utah because people often compare Idaho and Utah as ultra conservative, but I always look at a couple of things with Utah. I mean, Utah has elected more Latinas, um, for office, elected office, and for the state legislature uh, than Idaho has. Right now, Irma says, Maria, I'm so excited. There are six Latinas running for the state legislature in Idaho. And I said, Irma, and I want to see six Latinas in the next round running for the legislature here in Idaho. 
that's what I really want to see, and I've wanted to see it for a long, long time. And so because as a Latina leader, as a Chicana activist, I don't believe in asking somebody to do something that I myself am not willing to do. I will never, uh, when you volunteer for Latino Vote, I will never ask you to go out and do something I won't myself be willing to do. Knocking on doors, you know, phone banking, working in 108 degrees sometimes, uh, tabling at events and registering voters. Uh, I won't ask volunteers to do that because I think true leadership, right, leads by example and is down on the ground with volunteers uh, doing that. So we need to do more. Um, around youth, you know, do I believe that we need to have younger representation and representation that is not as well to do? Uh, there's a lot around campaign uh, and fair elections that needs to happen not only in this state, but in this country, to provide opportunities for an average person, an average citizen to run for office. And we can change that, folks. The things that I was gonna say about Utah, two things, um, in-state tuition for undocumented students, Utah has had it for like 12 years now. Uh, driver's licenses, even though they have a little special sticker for undocumented workers, Utah has had them folks for you know over 10 years and so when we look at and we say how conservative Utah is they've um, approved policy that in Idaho our legislators will not even go there you know and personally as a woman you know we've got the power uh, November 6 is coming out there are some good candidates running um, that will truly represent all not just from here out, but from the heart and the soul out. And that's the quality, uh, integrous individuals that we need representing us. Um, so I don't know that I totally answered your question, but, um, but I think that we need to, to run more. Because it's 737, so we have time. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for asking that question. I, in passing, mentioned Dr. Andrade and the summit that the Commission on Hispanic Affairs put on over at the um, Boise on the Grove a couple of weeks ago, which was fabulous. The turnout from the community and just folks, uh, it wasn't a huge turnout, but the issues that were presented and when one looked at the common strand among all those um, issues, it's at the policy level. Where it's all gonna come to a head will be at the policy level, and it will be how legislators vote or not vote um, for certain things that the Latino community needs. Um, it's not even about want, it's about needing. And those issues were education at the top and obvious, for obvious reasons. I mean, you look at, um, depending if we count District of Columbia or not, what Idaho spends per child um, in education is, uh, we're number 49. I mean, it, it's tragic. Uh, we should be looking for people who not only say they support education, but who truly, their actions are consistent with the words that come out of their mouths around education, uh, and we know that that's tied to economics, right? Jobs uh, that can be available in Idaho if we don't have a strong education and we don't fund education adequately. And that, by the Constitution of Idaho, is required. If you haven't read the Mike Ferguson report, uh, visit uh, the website and look at, he is an economist and you know he's a Republican, but he's very open in how, how he talks about the tie with education and economics, and that employers and big companies and good paying companies, as long as we don't ad adequately fund education, are not gonna come here uh, for the most part. And as long as we keep giving incentives for folks to take, to outsource the jobs. So definitely, um, 
education, so, so key for our community, and healthcare. There was a great presentation, and for us as women, um, for the most part, everybody, not everybody, many people, especially policymakers, uh, blast uh, what is the Affordable Care, Health Care Act that everybody labels, or many people label Obamacare, but it's Affordable Health Care Act and what it does for individuals who are not covered and what it can do. The presenter uh, spoke positively that at least this governor didn't shut it down like some governors uh, on the state exchange and they recently, the panel, the, he, the task force, recently gave a recommendation just in the last couple of days. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens. So education, healthcare, um, including adult basic education, mental health care, because Idaho, if you look at what mental health services are available in Idaho, oh my gosh. I always say we're like 25 years behind the times. And a lot of that is around policy and what our policy makers, they're not willing, you know, um, to go where we haven't gone before. They just wanna maintain the status quo. And then the third one, immigration, uh, where in-state tuition came up. And it's not just for Latino students. I mean, there are other undocumented individuals um, in the country. It's not just Latino. Yes, Latinos make a big number of those students, but it affects other um, youth from other countries. And then the last issue was around civic engagement and um, electing, you know, and not necessarily just our own, but that should be a priority, but electing those who will truly represent our community. Uh, again, not just from the lips out, but where they actually mean it and will support policy that's beneficial to the community and will turn policy down that's detrimental to the community. So, um, yeah, those are, and uh, Community Council of Idaho did record um, those presentations. It was fabulous. Dr. Andrade from the U.S. Leadership Institute was just fabulous. So if, you know, if there's that opportunity. If you all have not seen um, the uh, documentary, there are two documentaries, as I think Arnold was asking about pesticides. Um, if you haven't seen the documentary, The Harvest, I strongly recommend um, that you view that. And if you haven't uh, viewed the documentary, Precious Knowledge, that's another documentary around Latino issues, uh, current, that, that are really good documentaries to watch. 